Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Born to Read. We're following up our last episode on Calvinism is Stupid um, with a, a follow-up to specifically the last point of Calvinism as, as we arranged it, uh, the definite atonement of Christ, which is, I think, Jeremiah, who is here. I am here. Having yeah. just taken his first part of the CPA exam. Yep, my brain is fried. Congratulations. Thanks. Not on the brain, brain being fried, but on the... Well, uh, yeah, don't say congrats yet because I could have failed. I don't know. Okay. Well, congratulations on completing it. Thanks. I will hold the second half of the congratulations till you uh, get results back. Thank you. Yeah. I don't want to get my hopes up or anything, so I'm just going to try not to let it eat me alive until I get the results. No worries. I'm sure you passed. We'll see. 52% sure that you passed. <laughs> But on the last, on the point of the last point of Calvinism, the definite atonement of Christ, this is one of the probably the most hotly debated points yeah. of Calvin, if not the most. I, yeah. I think it's a hard time uh, because generally people will, will hear this and will go, well, how can you say that Christ only died for the elect? Mm -hmm. And how can you prove that? Like, it never says that in scripture. Yeah. Um, or you have somebody like a Leighton Flowers who will, um, reference okay paul says christ died for me and so that's too reductionistic to say oh we could take that text and say that christ died only for paul mm. if, we, if we're taking that as a, a strictly literal sense so the book today is the death of death in the death of christ it's the it's john owen the puritan writer's defense of uh the definite atonement of Christ, what, mm -hmm. what his death accomplished. And it's probably, if you want to know anything about li limited atonement or definite atonement, this is like the yeah. definitive work. Right. Yeah. Go this is the one, this is the one where, um, I think I read this like seriously a long time ago. I got it for like a dollar on, uh, some book app. And so I like, I don't remember anything from this book to be honest. It was so long ago. Uh, but I've always told people like, a lot of people would be like, hey, I you know, I like all all the points of Calvinism except for limited atonement. I'm like, yeah, I get where you're coming from. Just read the death of death and the death of Jesus Christ and uh, see where you come out. And most of the time, if somebody does read it, they're like, oh, yeah, I was, I had misconceptions. And that that dude, John Owen, his logic, rigorous. It's yeah. just unbeatable. Well, and what I, what I think is interesting is in his, in his writing, he's not just it's clearly not just philosophical. Like he's, he's defending this from scripture and from texts and knows what the texts say, knows what the texts mean and applies it. And so when you're reading through this, when, when you're just flipping through this book, you can just see um, there, there are scripture references throughout everywhere. There, there, I don't think there's a page in here that doesn't have a scripture reference on it where like, you know, he's this, this his arguments and his, his thought pattern is thoroughly drenched mm. in scripture and scriptural proof. So this isn't something that um, he just made up, uh, you know, in his head and is just trying to run with it and then trying to defend it as, you know, putting Christian language on it. He's actually taking scriptural themes throughout the whole of scripture and applying them right. to the doctrine of the atonement. Um, and probably the most famous, if anybody's ever encountered it, or even anybody ever discussing this, his most famous piece of this is his, um, some people will call it the triangle, some people will call it the, the four um, propositions, but he has the, okay, if we take the, the death of Christ, and this is how, the book is broken up into four books, four smaller books. Um, and in it, he kind of takes a, takes a different stab at it from four different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Um, so what he ends up doing though, is in the first book, he establishes what was the general end seeking to be accomplished by God. We know the atonement happened. We know that Christ's death did something. All Christians believe that Christ's death did something. What did it do? And to what end was it accomplished? Is what is where the debate lies, right. um, and so then you're you're going okay, it accomplished something. Now we have to know. He he goes through what are the what are the means of the end? What what how do you follow to all the way to the end? And what is the end then accomplished based on how the means work? 
So he gives this proposition. Christ could have died. You can go all or some, both for sin and for men. So mm-hmm. in our, our Calvinism is stupid episode, I referenced making a chart. I have the chart sitting right in front of you me did that, make I, one, that yeah. I made myself. Uh, <laughs> and so you have, uh, if he died for some men or all men, or if he died for some sin or all sin. Mm-hmm. So if you just start, um, okay, let's say he died for all sins of all men. Universalism. You have a universalism proposition there. You're then you're, The question then you have to ask is, un, is unbelief a sin? Mm. If unbelief is a sin, then you have to ask, did Christ die for it? Mm. If Christ died for it, then why aren't all men saved? If he didn't die for it, then he didn't die for all sins, which means that he didn't die for all sins of all men. And then you have to kind of dis- dismiss that away. Right. Okay. So now, we, now that's, a, that's a pretty straightforward one. I think the easiest one to dismiss in this grid, um, and I just label it heresy and you just kind of yeah. dismiss it, is that he died for some sins of some men. Yeah. If that's the case, no one can be saved. There's just no way. that. Who, okay, so has he elected then some men to only pay for some of their sins so that they have to then do something to get themselves into heaven? <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, you're, you're left. No Orthodox Christian is going to affirm that position. Yeah, it's like Pelagianism. Yeah. Uh, the third one is all sins of some men, um, or some some sins of all men. Sorry, I should say it that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Some sins of all men, um, which is puts you in the same category as the sum of some. Wait, no, no. Now this one's Pelagianism. Yeah. This one. So this is like. Christ paid for all sins of, or, or some sins of all men. So the, the, the payment was made to get you halfway across the chasm. Yeah. But you're going to have to, you're going to have to make the final jump yourself. Yeah. The rest is up to you. Um, which ultimately makes the death of Christ ineffectual is what I put in that, in that box is it's, it's an ineffectual atonement. It, it sort of paid for everybody. Um, but not completely for anybody. And so when you, when you look at all three of those propositions, um, all sins of all men, some sins of all men, or uh, some sins of all men, then you have uh, three propositions that just don't really work. Yeah. So then the only one that really works is that he died for all sins of some men. Mm-hmm. And again, he goes into this, and towards the end of the book, he, he defends that this is not just, I'm not saying that this is just a couple of people. Yeah. He's saying that, it, we're saying it's a definite atonement, but that's still a great multitude. And, and uh, towards the end of the book, he actually has this, uh, he goes through objection passages that, um, who, who objects to what passages, what uh, do the different people say? Um, and it makes, it, he, he just dismantles everything um <laughs> like john owen is liable to do yes it's just what he does um might i say though the sum the sum sins of all men that is i think what's prevalent today i would say uh, because when you ask a non-calvinist most non-calvinists are going to claim that they're not arminians so just to be charitable call them non-calvinists uh when you ask them what differentiates you from your buddy who's not repenting and uh Unless they're going to admit to an irresistible grace and a definite atonement, there has to be something else that's differentiating the two. And most of the time, it's a choice. Most of the time, it's a personal belief or faith. And that's that's where you go into the canons of Dort, which were a response to the remonstrance of the Arminians, and they accuse them of going back to Rome. Because in the end, it really does, logically, if you follow it to its end, it really does affect justification. You really are saying that you have something to do with your justification. Right. Which, again, John Owen is Mr. I wrote 7,000 pages of a commentary on Hebrews. Hebrews. (laughs) Uh, And so his writings, I think one of the things that really helped solidify this for me is his view that the sacrifice of Christ, the atonement, his death on the cross, 
is inseparable from his high priestly work as intercessor. That Christ is at the right hand of the Father, interceding on behalf of his people. And he does not intercede for those for whom he did not die. And so if we, and this is, this is all a defense of Christ being a good mediator, that he's, if he's the perfect high priest, as Hebrews lays out, he has to be good at what he does. He has to be perfect at what he does. And it has to be, what he does has to be accomplished. Where the, the earthly high priests had a temporary priesthood, uh, a priesthood that required a sacrifice year after year um, to make atonement for the people. If you don't have that in view of, okay, this, these guys, the, the earthly t- priests were temporary and Christ's priesthood is forever and perfect. Um, you can't separate his sacrificial work from his intercessory work. He has to be interceding on behalf of the people for whom he died for. I don't like ending sentences with propositions, but there we go. Uh, But his his ultimate purpose is to say, I died for my people, my sheep. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep, and he prays for them so that not one of them would be lost, that all that the Father gives him would come to him. And so if you try and separate his sacrifice or the, the, the $10 word, uh, that he uses over and over again is the oblation, uh, his his sacrifice, the oblation of Christ and the intercession of Christ can't be separated, and so uh, that that for me was just reading reading his mm-hmm. arguments on that line from Hebrews as being one of the best commentators on Hebrews was yeah. just really really helpful overall. So um, at the end he he has uh, this really cool juxtaposition between the two uh, positions, uh, which he kind of sums up as like universalist and a definite atonement, uh, an advocate for definite atonement. Uh, what was your favorite part of those uh, juxtapositions? Well, I thought it was interesting the way he, I mean, he just lays out and goes down. It's, uh, he's got eight points that shows how the, uh, how the, the differences are, are exp- exposed um so for the for the universalist number one is that christ died for all and every one elect and reprobate alike Mm -hmm. the definite person says that the christ died for the elect only which when you say that out loud some people will hear that and go well how could he he's supposed to be the savior of the world that's that's not very savior of the world like to Mm -hmm. only die for some two the universalist says most of them for whom Christ died are damned. Mm-hmm. Two, for the uh, definite atonement or the particular, is all those for whom Christ died are certainly saved. Mm-hmm. I have lost none that the Father has given me. Right. You know, uh, as the Gospel of John says. Number three, universalist, Christ by his death purchased not any, not any saving grace for them for whom he died. Basically, um, th- there's no particular. It's not a guarantee. Yeah. Um, for the for the definite definitarian, can I make up a word? Sure. Is that, does that work? Definitarian. Okay. The sure. definitarian. Um, Christ by his death purchased all saving grace for them for whom he died. Mm. Mm-hmm. That's limited grace, Lim- uh, irresistible grace. Yeah. <laughs> uh, number four, the universalist says. Christ took no care for the greatest part of them for whom he died, that ever they should hear one word of his death. So he died for the whole world, but how many people will not necessarily be saved? Mm-hmm. Yikes. Like, there's going to be people who his death was paid for, but will never hear the gospel. Yeah. Um, and that's, Owen is saying that that, that reflects poorly on the Savior. That, right. That he he didn't do a good enough job to make his sacrifice available to all of those people for whom he died. Um, hmm. Number four, it's he, the the definitarian says Christ sends the means and reveals the way of life to all them for whom he died. Right. They will hear the gospel. They will be regenerated. They will come to Christ, and they will not be lost. He doesn't fail. Right. Number five, universalist 
Christ in his death did not ratify nor confirm a covenant of grace with any federates, but only procured his by his death that God might, if he would, enter into a new covenant with whom he would and upon what condition he pleased. Right. That's a mouthful. Uh, Translation, the, they believe it's potential, not yeah. actual. The, definite, the definitarian says the new covenant of grace was confirmed to all the elect in the blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. Number six, Christ might have died and yet no one be saved. And that's where I think for me, right. the definite atonement of Christ says that he actually died. And this is his definitarian position. Christ by his death purchased upon covenant and compact an assured peculiar people the pleasure of the Lord prospering to the end in his hand hmm. that um, there is, there is a potential. If you say that Christ died for all and the choice is left to the individual to choose God, there is a potential that no one goes to heaven. Yeah. And, and in that sense, then how can somebody who believes that say that Jesus crushed the head of the serpent at the cross? Right. You can't because he didn't accomplish anything at the cross. And that's in that view. Well, and what's what's scary about that for for me is that when I look at this and I say, you know, the Calvinists will get accused of being uh, mean for saying that Christ only died for the elect. Yeah. But I'm saying that there will actually be people in heaven. Yeah. The the, the Universalist, as John Owen puts, will say, we have we actually have no guarantee that anybody goes to heaven. Yeah. That because Christ died uh, because Christ's death. Um, uh, he he might have died, made it available for everybody, but there's a chance that nobody's be, be saved. Right. I don't think anybody would affirm that, but if you take it to its logical end, you have to admit that that is a reasonable possibility mm -hmm. to which you can't say that Jesus was the savior of the world if if there's possible if there's possibility that nobody is saved. Right. Uh, okay, so just to, we are, we're already out of time. No! But just real quick. <laughs> but we just, have two more points. Just real quick. <laughs> I really want to ask this because this, this is so common. Yeah. Um, what do you say to somebody who says, Tim, uh, when it comes to that whole definite atonement thing, although it's logical, I like your chart. It's very logical. It's just not biblical. Mm. What do you say to somebody who says that? Because I've heard that a lot, actually. I've heard it said. Well, I think, I think I already alluded to it, but specifically for me was looking at the book of Hebrews and seeing that when, when you show Christ as the better sacrifice than the old covenant uh, sacrifices and then him as the better high priest and showing that his death and uh, intercession are in inseparably linked. Um, and that's what the whole, I, I look at Hebrews and I go, that's the whole point of Hebrews. Hebrews is a 13 chapter defense of definite atonement, at, at least the, the way I see it. And I think the way, uh, John Owen sees it, and and he explains it very thoroughly uh, in in the book here. So that that's what I would say. I don't know. Do you have a different perspective? I oh, I just I always dispute the premise to that question that somehow the Bible isn't logical, or that logic cannot be biblical. There, there's like there's a there's an anti intellectual tendency to forget that what is the Greek what is the Greek word for the word in the beginning of John the logos. Right, which is where we get where our, we word, get our logic. word logic. So the Bible is logical; it's systematic. There's no uh, uh, contradictions in the character of God, and since the Bible is revealing the character of God, there's not going to be any contradictions. So it's perfectly okay to use logic, to use the faculties that God gave us, because we believe that God created it and established it forever. Right, and doesn't doesn't change mm -hmm. like like His character. And he when he when he goes to do a job, he gets it done. He doesn't he doesn't build a house halfway and then say, eh, maybe the house will build itself even though it can't. So if we take the the death of death and the death of Christ to say that the definite atonement of Christ, if you just if we boil down the definite atonement of Christ, I would say I could summarize it in just saying Jesus is good at his job. Right. And and kind of leave it at that. Did he do his job? the way he was supposed to, to the complete end. He finished it. He tied up all loose ends. Mm -hmm. Jesus is good at his job. And his, his death mm -hmm. accomplished what it was supposed to accomplish. Yep. So. That's it. That's it.
Once again, the book is The Death of Death and the Death of Christ by John Owen. What do you rate it? Uh, I would actually probably give it like a seven on just, it, it's a difficult, it's a very difficult read. It's John Owen, yeah. Um, like the, the type is... Is that small. abridged? Did you read it abridged? This one is, uh, it, this one is actually uh, unabridged. Oh. But I've listened to the audiobook as well, which was a little bit tweaked to be more modern English. Mm-hmm. Still, still really challenging. The yeah. audiobook is like sixteen and a half hours long, Gosh. so like it, it's a it's a challenging, meaty read. Um, I actually would recommend it more for reference than for just sitting and reading it all the way through. Mm-hmm. It's helpful to go back and look at specific arguments. He deals with answering specific obje- objections out of specific passages, so it's a good one to have on the library shelf. Um, not one that you're going to sit down on uh, Saturday morning and be like, oh, let me grab my coffee and read, <laughs> read a little John Owen. But uh, it, it's, a, it's a good, um, it's a helpful resource, um, but not something that I'm like, oh, yeah, just go, go get this out and, and read it at a, oh, at a coffee shop. Like, yeah. you have, okay. I literally have to read it in like five-page increments. You know, it's just, uh, I feel like I relate to John Owen. Whenever I start talking, people start yawning, <laughs> and I just feel like, you know, that's my people right there. Yeah. Well, there, there you have it. The death of death and the death of Christ. Get it on your shelf um, and then read it one or two pages at a time and uh, <laughs> chew, chew away at it just uh, bit by bit. Uh, I think it's be uh, very spiritually beneficial uh, yeah. as, as you grow in understanding in the love and appreciation of the death uh, and work of Christ. Mm-hmm. We will catch you next time, guys. We've got an exciting episode coming up next week. Uh, addressing I'm excited. one of our favorite topics, although every topic is Jeremiah's favorite topic. Every topic. I love um, every topic. And that is the topic of covenant theology. That's right. We will catch you guys next time.